So our last speaker before lunch is Dr. Dudu Ahim from the Department of Material Science and Engineering in Ghana, and he's a past director of the Institute of Applied Science and Technology. This is a very topical subject. You may be aware that the University of Cambridge is having a detailed debate about fossil fuels and renewable energy. And so, David, you're right on target in terms of subject matter with your photovoltaic cells. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to congratulate uh, um, um, the Cambridge Africa program, and especially um, CAPREX, which I happen to be the first um, fellow to arrive in Cambridge on the CAPREX program, and um, happen to also work with um, the Cambridge Graphene Center. So what I'm going to talk to you about is just briefly um, my Cam Cambridge experience and um, how it has impacted on um, myself, my department, and um, some general outlook on, on science. Just to let you know where I'm coming from, those who know and those who don't, um, this is Ghana, and it's a beautiful place that you might want to visit. Um, you can do a couple of visits um, I'm there. You can sit on a crocodile, and um, you want to have that experience. This is my university, University of Ghana. Um, we have about 40,000 um, um, students founded in 1948, which is pretty younger than, of course, um, here. And we have um, the college system making up about five colleges. Um, and I belong to the College of Basic and Applied Sciences. So my department, Department of Material Science and Engineering, was established in 2004 which means it's also very, very young in terms of University of Ghana. And um, what we do, we do undergraduate training with uh, thematic areas in um, ceramics, uh, metallurgy, and um, polymers. We recently started our graduate program that is 2014, after my CAPREX experience. And um, we do um, teams in energy materials for health and then um, structural materials. So basically, um, this is an opportunity for those who might want to come to Ghana. Next year, I'm hosting a bigger conference in Ghana, so you can um, come to the Pan-African Crystallography um, Conference. So to my work, um, what we did here, the main idea was to facilitate some level of training uh, in graphene and some experimental techniques that I'm going to learn and then also um, develop um, potential collaborations and then dissemination of this. This was um, one of the reasons for establishing CAPREX to be able to have this partnership coming together. Just a brief on what um, graphene is about. Graphene can be taken from graphite, simply um, from pencil um, that we have, and then you can take um, different sheets. So it's typically thinking about it as your, your book. Um, which is a graphite, and then um, the various sheets that are in. And it has interesting properties, and some of the properties that um, include high transparency, and, and it has some conductivity. And because of that, you find several applications. You can find applications in, in, in polymers, in, in touch screens. These days, um, you have um, Androids, and you can find applications also in um, solar energy. So basically, um, some of the applications include sorry, um, solar cells, uh, biosensors, and energy storage, um, of which the solar um, cells and then energy storage is of um, particular interest um, to us. So we can apply this material in um, solar cells devices um, as transparent um, conductive windows for active um, um, material, um, also channel for chart transport, and also as a catalyst. And it also finds applications in um, organic solar cells where we still use all these. And theoretically, we found that, that graphene um, can have about more than 12% um, using graphene as an active um, material in your solar cell application. What I did was basically to look at um, the dye-sensitized solar cell, which is mimicking um, photosynthesis and taking energy from um, the sun and trying them with local um, plant extracts from Ghana. So the idea was um, to use this um, material, 
graphene and incorporating um, titanium dioxide and making a solar cell. One particular reason for choosing our um, graphene was trying to make some um, replacement with platinum, which is um, a precious um, component that makes the costs usually go up. Graphene in basic terms can be produced in terms of um, large sheets when you want to use it for um, industrial applications. Basically, we looked at two different um, uh, methods. That is um, by chemical um, vapor deposition technique or what we call the um, liquid phase exfoliation. And this liquid phase exfoliation is what we produce our ink in from. So basically, um, when you produce an ink, you want to look at the density, you want to look at the viscosity, you want to look at um, some um, few properties. So what we do is to have our graphite. We add, um, we put it in solution, which could be an organic sol uh, solvent. We could also use um, water and then um, add a surfactant and we ultrasonicate and then we can get our component, which is up here, uh, being used as um, our ink. So we go through these different iterations and then we come out with our ink, which um, can be used in an inkjet printer. This is a typical printer technology that I got when I was here in um, the Cambridge Graphene Center. So what we do is to look at the um, technology of um, the cartridge and you have to have particles which are flakes that are less than one micron so that they don't clock um, your nozzle and then you can do um, your printing. So basically, um, you, we are able to also um, see how um, the inks flow and then see if you have a stable um, ink so that you don't um, blot um, the substrate that you are printing on. This is a typical one um, that we did so we could um, produce our ink and then put it in our cartridge and then we did some couple of printing um, um, works that um, we had here. So you can print on different substrates from flexible, from glass, from um, all different ones and we can do um, electronics also um, with this. So what we did was also to print on glass um, substrates which we um, tend to put in our application for our Dyson slash solar cell. Not to bore you much, this is just a simple procedure that we go through. We have um, a substrate that is heated and then we have a dye, typically the dye that I brought from Ghana, we put it in and then we coat that surface to be able to absorb um, the light. We make um, um, drills behind, we'll be able to put in either we put our graphene or we put um, um, platinum and then we place them together and um, this is filled with an electrolyte and then we go on to do our testing and this is the, different, the testing that we did um, in our center um, in West Cambridge. So these are typical um, materials that we used. Um, these are common um, to Ghana. We have um, hibiscus. We have the hibiscus subderifer that is typically a drink actually. Um, you can use it for tea and then um, um, the Pride of Barbados as well. There is a paper that already came out which we um, um, said um, it achieved the aim of um, Caprix to be able to have at least um, uh, the collaboration and then to also generate um, good quality papers um, with our partners. So what is my Cambridge experience and then how has that impacted on my personal and professional um, development and then also uh, on University of Ghana student training. Um, here, this is our experience in Cambridge. So um, what goes on here, we came in and we also had um, part of it getting around. I had my bike, which is um, a popular one that you always find on, on the website. And then, of course, I did not just do um, those solar cell applications. I did some couple of panting on here. I went um, across um, the site. And there were social gatherings, um, interesting times. So it's not just sitting in uh, engineering. And we also made a couple of presentations. We did um, talks um, to the Cambridge community. Then we also did talks in University of Ghana. This is where I worked. And then um, this was quite interesting for me coming from um, Ghana to work uh, in Cambridge to have access to high quality facilities. I worked in the clean room, and which I don't have um, in Ghana. It gave me a um, lot of experience to work um, yeah, with, the, with the team here. This is me um, working in the clean room and doing my um, work here. And then we have all these experimental facilities that were 
um, initially not um, available to me there. We also went further to seek um, other collaborations, um, went on um, to Sweden in Uppsala and um, Professor Anders is uh, one of the top people in dye-sensitized solar cells, who was a postdoc to actual um, um, uh, Professor Gratzel. So this was um, an experience for us to um, work closely with him. Beyond that, we, there were um, several presentations that um, we have um, um, done as part of my work in, in Cambridge. So these were also presentations that I did uh, um, in Italy, and then I did a couple of them in, in France as well. What impact has have, um, have uh, I um, gotten from the Capric experience? When I came to Cambridge, I was a lecturer and a Capric fellow in 2012. After my experience on my return, I became the head of department. I was promoted to senior lecturer and became the head of department then also have um, experience with um, a Carnegie-sponsored uh, program that is a regional initiative uh, in science um, education, which has a branch called Africa Material Science and Engineering Network, which I am the coordinator. In 2016, I became the acting director of the Institute of Applied Science and Technology, and now a fellow of the Africa um, Science Leadership Program, which I think um, has a lot to do with uh, my Capric um, experience. Whilst I was here, um, I got the opportunity um, to benefit also from the Aborada um, project. To let you know, when I came, our department was still very young, and they were now going to set up our postgraduate program, and this was very helpful um, to us. This is me packing a couple of equipment um, that I shipped to Ghana to um, help in our um, um, laboratory, and initially that was the lab, and we have a couple of um, equipment that came in, and we are proud to say that uh, Dr. Jennifer Barnes was in Ghana with, with James and then um, David to help open um, this, and it's benefiting um, our students. So this is my research group uh, that I developed after my Capric experience. So we have the hybrid and energy material research group, and we do a couple of things from um, nanostructured materials, to carbon technology, and then we've gone further to have a group, um, which I didn't have um, initially. I have now um, master students, and I also have um, four PhD students who are learning under me, and I've expanded my collaborations beyond um, 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 Cambridge. And other colleagues have benefited from our experience based on um, what we went to share in Ghana after my Capric experience. There was a forum that um, people came in to listen to, and then it has also impacted on my colleagues who are here um, today. So Dr. Abuyaya <coughs> has benefited, and then um, Nyangsin and then Ebenezer who happened to be in the audience. So going further, um, we are going to establish a center of excellence in, in energy, which is in partnership with um, colleagues from Cambridge. And then there are hubs that are going to be in Ghana, and Pakistan, India, and Tanzania, tackling the critical energy um, and problem. And then we hope that um, by the end of the year, we hope um, this um, to happen. So briefly, in summary, um, the fellowship has really helped um, my research and uh, professional development, and then also um, has also improved the academic um, and then uh, mentorship that we have given to our students and then also um, colleagues and younger um, researchers in terms of human resource um, capacity um, to our departments. And then we have encouraged um, um, student exchange and then towards the establishment of the center that we are looking um, forward to. And the Cambridge Africa program has also improved my outlook on science that has gone beyond um, the Dyson solar cells. So we do energy storage and um, different forms of um, science that I will not um, talk to you about. So these are my collaborators uh, that I've worked with um, in Cambridge, um, Dr. Tofik um, Hassan and um, the rest of the colleagues that helped me. My 
um, acknowledgement to um, the Cambridge Africa program for providing this um, opportunity, and the University of Ghana, um, the CAPRIX team, and of course, uh, my colleagues in the Department of Material Science and Engineering and then the Engineering School. Of course, um, I must say, when I came, we were made members of Wolfson College. So I am a proud member of Wolfson College now because of CAPRIX. And then um, Cambridge Africa program, and we thank Abarada for um, your support. Thank you very much. David, that was splendid. Questions? Up at the back. How convenient. Thanks. Um, Hi, I'm Josh. I'm a student here. I'm from South Africa. Um, I have a, a question for you that's not technical. Um, that's not my field of expertise by any means. But I was, I was wondering, so there, there's some concerns at the moment in the university that, for instance, the graphene, uh, what's it called, the Cambridge Graphene Center works with arms companies like BAE, Roke, uh, what's it called, Cobham, and so on. So I just wanted to ask, in terms of the, the kinds of research partnerships that you do, uh, particularly at the University of Ghana and these, these processes that you're setting up, beyond just the, the solar panel stuff, because that's relatively good, I would say. Um, how do you deal with issues of ethics in research, and not just in terms of the process of research itself, but also the products of your research and where that goes to? Thanks. Uh, well, um, it depends on um, which of the collaborators that you are dealing with, and then um, where you're doing. For instance, if you're doing something for a technology company, um, then you have to go by their terms. Of course, um, you have this confidentiality um, agreements that, um, that you have to um, go through. So usually it becomes um, slightly a challenge when you have to um, typically do it uh, mainly for um, the industry partner. Uh, but apart from that, um, we do not um, have a lot of ethical issues um, with, uh, for instance, when we work in, 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 in lasers and in energy storages in, in um, uh, digital displays. Of course, if you venture into where you're going to do the biosensors, that is where um, usually you have to go through a lot of these um, ethical clearance and things like this. So that's basically, yeah. And I'm not too sure about um, what goes beyond um, this, especially in the Cambridge Graphene Center, because I cannot um, speak much about um, what is going on there, yeah. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, Tandeka, I'm also a student here, but from South Africa, uh, also a social scientist, so <laughs> not a scientist at all, but I was wondering if you could maybe speak about solar energy in general as an opportunity for much of rural African spaces, um, and especially what are the major obstacles to that going forward, and do you think that, because a lot of people suggest that that might be um, the new hope for people in rural spaces because electrical grid energy is not really getting to them. Do you think that's a viable choice? Do you think that's where it's going or do you think the obstacles are too big? Um, I think it is um, for um, rural communities where you have, um, for instance, in medicine where um, you have to store um, different vaccines in, in freezers and um, they are in Ghana, for instance, there have been um, deployment of um, solar panels, um, what you call the solar grids, um, then solar farms, um, to provide um, um, electrification for rural communities. And then there are others that have, for instance, in, in the hospitals, to have a panel that will be able to um, let you run um, your freezer. I think it is a very um, viable choice. The challenge usually is with the storage of um, the energy. So in most cases, you have the, the panel that has been installed, but you don't have the battery. But we realize that in other cases, you have batteries, but there is a need beyond um, the freezer. 
you find a whole community that will want to charge their cell phones. And during the day, you have people plugging in different equipment and drawing out all the energy. In the night when you really need it, it's not available. Right. So it's one of um, the things that we are proposing in this hub that we are going to do is to look at um, the energy storage and then how to recycle even the batteries and um, do some sort of training for um, the rural communities that we provide. Um, you do the generation and then you do the storage and then you do the recycling. What would be the motivation for someone that is far away to bring his or her battery? And what is the weight? Sometimes the weight alone of the battery, the, the storage, is even deterring for um, the rural folks to bring it to, say, the urban center for it to be um, recycled. So it's um, an area that we are going in. But I think um, it's um, a positive um, way to go for, for the renewables, especially where they are not connected to the main grids. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my name is Raj Bhopal. Um My question is about the technology of the dye sensitized solar cell. You mentioned that there's a few different potential applications that you're looking at, but I'm wondering, in the case of the um, solar panel, you know, is do you think that do, is there a potential? Is there um, are the dye sensitized solar cells going to make an impact on photovoltaics for solar energy? Um, yes, and then it depends on the generation of um, the, the, the solar cells. So you can look at um, either first generation, second generation, uh, or third generation um, solar cell. This is um, the dye solar cell was chosen as um, one of the simple routes in producing your, your, your cell. And then I do that for my students, to do the student training at least to be able to produce cells by themselves. Even if you don't go through um, this printing technology, you can simply make something that can generate your energy. And with that, um, the way to go will be to use, for instance, flexible ones, flexible um, um, solar cells, or make a um, couple of panels that could be used for milder applications. Where you, the demand is higher, then you might go in still for um, the silicon base um, solar, solar cells, which are um, coming down anyway. The argument initially was that the, um, the solar cell, the silicon based were quite expensive, and if you find alternatives, even though um, that's um, coming down. So for um, basic science purposes, um, the students are able to do this, and then they are able to go beyond um, that until the time where um, we could go beyond at the lab and then produce these silicon base, for instance, um, by the students themselves. The idea is that we need to train a critical mass of the people to be able to um, either they produce it or they have the technology, the understanding, so that they can um, do the repairs. I mean, sometimes you, like from the question that um, she asked, if a solar panel is not working, maybe there is just a connection that is not, or is covered in dust. And then you have to bring somebody from somewhere, pay the plane ticket for the person to come, and then find that this is the reason, right? So um, it's quite important to um, train the critical mass to be able to um, handle some of um, these ones. Good. Well, we'll call Dave. Thank you very much indeed, David, for that fabulous talk.